I'm sure everyone has experienced some human resources at some point in their life, and they're not the most thrilling people in the world. And I don't even work in the fun bit. I work in something called HR shared services. Okay? What that means is the HR departments up and down the country, they take their most boring, their most repetitive, and their most bureaucratic tasks, and they outsource it to me. Okay? <laughs> this is the stuff that is too boring for other human resources departments to do, and me and my colleagues do that. Okay? I am buried so deep into bureaucracy, it's hard to even explain what I do to you. I am a pedantic pencil pusher, okay? and I'm the worst author of them as well. And sometimes when I just start to speak about it, when someone asks me that question, I can just sense their minds start to drift away onto their lunch, onto other things, and they think, man, I wish I hadn't asked about this. <laughs> because I can talk about it for a while, but you don't want me to, okay? But the worst thing about it all is that sometimes I actually enjoy it, okay? It's, I, I mean, I do a completely ordinary, nine to five, Monday to Friday job, and it's all right. I enjoy parts of it. But the problem is this. My job is really, really ordinary. But we live in a world that has eyes only for that which is extraordinary. Okay? Take kids, for example. There isn't a single kid downstairs that if you were to go and ask them, they would say they really want to grow up and work in human resources. <laughs> okay? Not one of them. They wouldn't say they want to work in a shop, or they want to be an office administrator, or they want to work in the payroll department. They don't rave about how they'd love to experience the thrills of being an accountant, or how they care about nothing more than being a quantity surveyor. All right? Kids talk about how they want to do fun, amazing, exciting jobs. They want to be doctors, paramedics, police officers, firefighters, engineers. They want to be pilots. They want to be, some of them, chefs. The le less realistic ones dream even bigger. They want to be Premier League footballers. They want to be astronauts, princesses, stormtroopers. They want to be superheroes. And worst of all, some want to be Instagram influencers, YouTubers, and Twitch streamers. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Don't, don't Google it. Don't Google it. You don't want to know. But in short, no one wants to be ordinary when they grow up. But most of us end up there anyway. I, I didn't want to be ordinary. When I grew up, I really wanted to be the prime minister. I wanted to be able to tell everyone what to do. <laughs> but now what I do nine to five is I point out to people how they've incorrectly filled in forms. And if that number had been there, it would be fine. But because it's not, we've got to do the whole thing again, all right, from scratch. Some people here in this room have extraordinary jobs. But most of us, we're thoroughly ordinary people. And we live in a world that regards us as ordinary, as boring, and as average. And we're okay with the jobs that we do. We know we contribute towards other people's well-being. We know we do good jobs, but we also know our jobs aren't that interesting. Our lives aren't perhaps that interesting, and they're not the reason that people hang out with us. However, today, if you are thoroughly ordinary, if you do an ordinary job, if you live an ordinary life, and if you aren't particularly exciting, I have some good news. Because God made Christmas happen for you. And if you don't believe me, let's open up his word together. So I'm going to read from Luke 2, verses 8 to 20, from the New Living Translation. So if you have a Bible with you, it's great. You can open up and follow it along. It will also be just here on these screens as well. So this is a, a scene from the Christmas story uh, taken from uh, the Gospel of Luke, one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life. So Luke 2, verses 8 to 20. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, 
Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village, and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in a manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying, praising God for all they had seen and heard. And it was just as the angel had told them. Now this is a classic scene from Nativity plays everywhere. This is the extraordinary announcement by a bunch of angels that the Saviour is here. Jesus Christ has arrived. It is a scene filled with, with majesty, with glory. It starts with an angel appearing suddenly to some shepherds. The Lord's glory is all around them. It, it is terrifying to those who see it. Something divine happens at that time. They are heralding something that is majestic. Now, the angel tells them good news. The Messiah is born. The Lord is born. The Savior is born. And if they just go down the hill to that town of Bethlehem, they will get to meet him as a baby. And then instantly they are surrounded by God's armies of angels. A vast host appears of mighty, powerful beings, and they start to worship. Glory, they cry out, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. The Lord has come. We looked at some of this last week and it was wonderful. It was moving. It was Christmassy. It is a Christmas scene. But it is also really, really weird. Because it is weird who they are talking to. Because the angels could have chosen to descend into the center of Jerusalem, into a bustling metropolitan city, and they could have declared the arrival to everyone there. That's probably better. That means everyone would know about it and everyone would celebrate. They could have perhaps decided to appear in a grand court to some king or emperor and told him about it and said, look, a savior of the world has come. But they didn't do that. And, you know, they could have even just decided to appear in the center of Bethlehem, wake everyone up and tell them what's happened. But they didn't even do that. What they did was the angels arrived on a random hillside to a bunch of shepherds who were doing the night shift. These transcendent angels, these majestic beings, arrived and started speaking to some dirty farm workers and their sheep. Now, the Christmas story is so ingrained in us, so ingrained in our culture, that we just don't notice that when we read it. We think it's a nice rural story. We think it's nice and sweet. And it means we can dress kids up with dressing gowns, put tea towels on their head every year in the nativity play. But why did it happen? Why, in all the ancient world, did God send his angels to those shepherds right there? Why are the armies of God and all their power and majesty appearing in a field? Why are these extraordinary beings, some of the most powerful in the universe, talking to some of the most ordinary people that you could possibly find in the ancient world? I think when we ask that question, we find out something about God, and we find out something about the Christmas message. Because it shows that God cares deeply about these people, these thoroughly ordinary, boring people. And it shows us, therefore, that the Christmas message is for those ordinary people. It is not just good news for the special elite. It is not just for the king or for the emperor. It is not just for the rich or significant. But it is good news for all. And in going to the every man, the angels show that Christmas is for everyone. Because God cared about those shepherds. And he decided that amongst all the people in the Middle East, they were the ones who were going to find out first. And since it was such majestic news, he was going to give them the full show. The angels were going to turn up and sing. It didn't matter that they were shepherds. He was going to show them the glory of what he had done. Christmas is for everybody. 
It is for the boring people. It is for the fun people. It is for the ordinary people. It is for the extraordinary people. It is for the shepherd. It is for the wise man. It is for the human resources administrator. And it's for the astronaut as well. God sent Christmas for us all. But let's look again at that message that the angels brought to the shepherds. Because if God sent Christmas for us all, then he also sent Christ for us all. And if he sent Christ for us all, then Christ's work is open for all. In Luke 2, verses 10 to 12, the angels say this. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. The good news that the angels bring is all about a person. Someone has arrived. The Messiah, Jesus Christ. It is the Lord. It is God himself here on earth as a child. It is a savior. God himself has come down. God the Son has arrived on earth and his mission is one of salvation But he did not just come to save the rich and the talented. He did not just come to save the popular and the interesting. He came to save the ordinary shepherds too. He came to save those farm workers tending the sheep at night. Now, in my ordinary work life, I am surrounded by lovely people. Other people like me just doing ordinary jobs which aren't that exciting. And they are people living through the stresses and strains of an everyday, ordinary life. Uh, Take Rebecca, for instance. Uh, Rebecca used to be a teacher. She recently had a kid, and she decided being a teacher and raising a family was a bit too much. So she came and worked with us at HR Shared Services. Rebecca is kind. She is humble. And she does a really good job. Or how about James? James is really ambitious. James actually went out there and he got a degree in human resources, which I can imagine was incredibly fun three years. (laughs) But James is determined to work his way up. And he recently got a promotion and there's even bigger and better things lying ahead for James. There's Jackie. She's been with the team ages. Um, She used to work in reception, but she's moved across to this role. She's suffered a lot in her life. She's lost a lot. Um, But she's the experienced backbone of the team. She, she can process forms like nobody out there. And she always brings her dog to meetings. That's a team's meetings, not actually in the office, don't worry. There's, uh, there's Mark and there's Sarah, both of who are, are balancing family life and work in the office. They, uh, they take an, a late lunch so they can pop out, pick their kids up from school, and then come back. There's Jane, she recently joined. Uh, she's incredibly kind and protective of people around them. There's Sally, who's absolutely blind as a bat, But her job is to help other people see their way through the systems. They are marvelous, ordinary people that I spend my nine to five Monday to Friday with. And let me tell you something. Christ came for people like them. It was to people like them on that hillside that Christ was originally announced. It was to people like them that God boldly declared his love for one night in Bethlehem. 2,000 years ago. This world cares simply only about extraordinary things, about glitz and about glamour, about fame, about fortune. To be valued, you need to be unique. To have a brand to sell. You have to have a skill to amaze. You have to have a party trick. It's fair enough. Those things aren't that bad. It's okay to be famous. It's okay to have some glitz and glamour and some fame and fortune. Sounds fun, but maybe our God is not so distracted by pretty lights and big personalities. Maybe God cares about the ordinary person, the shepherd in the field, as much as he cares about everyone else. And if he does, maybe we should too. Maybe we should take a stand when we see the world only caring about those who are significant and go, actually, everyone matters because God cares about them all. We should be filled with respect for all because God respects all. We should preach the gospel to all because those are the people that God wants it to be preached to. He wants it to be declared to everyone, rich and poor, 
strong and weak, interesting and really boring. We should love because God has loved. You know, there may be some people here today who are feeling a bit ordinary. Like you've listened to this and you thought, yeah, I fit into that ordinary category. I know I do. But somewhere, sometime, someone tricked you into thinking that you are less because your job isn't that exciting or because you don't have any party tricks or because you weren't the class clown or because you are absolutely fine with drinking instant coffee and you don't understand what the hype is about, about grinding the beans. Maybe you had a dream when you were young that you would be an actor, a paramedic, a police officer, a firefighter, a, a pilot or a chef and maybe you wanted to pray f- uh, play for Newcastle in the Premier League. Maybe you wanted to be the first person to step into Mars or you wanted to save the world with your superpowers and maybe none of that happened. Maybe you ended up sitting in a chapel on Durham Road on a Sunday morning feeling thoroughly ordinary. Well forget what the world says, it's lying to you. God cares for you, and he sent his son for you. So join me in being thoroughly ordinary, having a thoroughly ordinary life, and smile, because it's Christmas, and there is good news for a saviour is born. Now, to help us reflect on this Christmas story, I'm actually going to play a song now called Who Would Have Dreamed? And in it are some of the themes that I've just chatted about. Um, In particular, it talks about the meeting of the ordinary and the extraordinary in the Christmas story. Because to a small town came great news and to some shepherds came the savior of the world. Um, But as you listen to it, can you do me a favor? Can you meditate on the things that it's saying? Can you meditate on the Christmas story and for what it means for you and for ordinary people just like us? So Sean, do you wanna play that song for us now?
In Micah 5, verses 2 to 5, it says this. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor is given birth, and the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Let us pray together.